I had to struggle in the 70s with questions of conscientious objection and in a sense standing against my culture, against my race, against the, the default option. We are going to need conscientious objectors in, in this generation who do the surprising thing and nevertheless who, who are a, a pain in the neck to the powers that be. Eight years ago, I interviewed Steve de Gritchy, who was a friend and a fellow conscience objector. I went to see him in his Maritzburg office at the University of KZN uh, to get him to explain more about a paper that he had written called The Olive Agenda, which had inspired those of us who were working on the Wild Coast issues of the Kolobini mining and the end to Wild Coast toll road. And Steve had written a very imaginative kind of article titled The Olive Agenda, which had inspired us because he, he found a way of integrating and combining what he called the brown, which is about poverty, and the green, which is about conservation and environment into a integrated sort of metaphor of the olive and of course the olive with its symbolic meaning is a symbol of peace as well we talk about the olive branch and he had drawn on both the hebrew scriptures and christian scriptures to give us what we really needed some inspiration a few months after the interview tragically steve drowned it was a very painful experience at steve's funeral and uh, I didn't quite know what else to do with this and left it really in the hands of John and his family. Eight years later, yeah, I was browsing in the bookshop and I came across John Noguchi's latest book, which is an autobiography titled I Have Come a Long Way, which it predictably covers, you know, how he and his family found meaning and came to terms with the death of, the tragic death of Steve. In the chapter towards the end of the book, it's titled The Road Unforeseen, and it begins with a, a quote from J.A.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where Elrond says, None can foretell what will come to pass if we take this road or that. Now, at this last, we must take a hard road, a road unforeseen. There lies its hope, if hope it be. The road must be trod, but it will be very hard. Steve's sharing around the Olive Agenda and what he reflected in this interview I think has acquired something of a prophetic quality with the passage of eight years. And I hope now his family, friends and students are ready to look back and listen to what Steve had to say to us back then. Uh, because given the really dire reality facing South Africa and uh, President Zuma and the world under Donald Trump, I hope it will fortify more of us to become pains in the neck of the powers that be. Yeah, what got you into this job? What's, what's your kind okay. of brief background? Um, John, I was, I'm an ordained minister in the Congregational Church uh, and I was drawn to ministry really in my struggles to work out how as a Christian I should be responding to the apartheid struggle in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So that was the late 1970s. I Grew up as a Christian, Christian home, and was very aware of how the struggle as to how one should respond as a Christian to the apartheid era. This is in the 70s, late 70s. Went to university, and in that process, and it's a long story, but felt called to the Christian ministry, so went on to study postgraduate theology and was particularly drawn to questions of political ethics in Christianity, in theology. And so pursued academically my master's and went overseas for a year in New York City. I did another master's and then doctorate in the area of political ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1994, when uh, changes happened in South Africa, I moved with my wife and young family to a rural area, Kuruman, in the Northern Cape, and got very interested in questions of uh, 
in the post-apartheid era, how does one now move uh, from resistance to assistance? How do we now get involved in making life better for people when the political scenario has changed? But just to go back a bit, the, the whole conscription issue, was that the oh, issue sure. for you? Yeah. And what, what was your kind of, kind of uh, how did you find yourself caught up in that? Moment? Well, I was pretty clear I wasn't going to the army at all. And in my matric year, got to know Peter Moll and Richard Steele, who were in detention at the time, 1979 and was very struck by their witness. Uh, the minister in our church, uh, Douglas Bax, happened to be the Presbyterian minister who had, um, what would be the term, had, had uh, presented the what's known as the 1974 Hummins Kral resolution of the South African Council of Churches that was mm -hmm. uh, seconded by Bayes Nordi, which called on the churches to think about conscientious objection. So the whole CO debate was really alive in our church. The church where I grew up, Rondebosch Congregational Church, even though Doug was a Presbyterian minister, um, was where the conscientious objector support group met and it was very much part of our lives there. So my struggle wasn't just an academic one, it was really what did I do with my life and I suppose in some ways, all the years of studying was an attempt to avoid mm -hmm. the conscription issue. But then in, when I came back from New York City, I at that stage the legislation had changed and I was able to be a religious objector mm -hmm. uh, and worked as a hospital chaplain at Kruliskia Hospital and started working on my doctorate, so that was 87. Um, I think I must have been the only objector who was deeply miffed that my service came to an end in 1990 when the ANC was unbanned and the Namibian war ended because I had set myself up as to do six years of conscientious objector service and do my doctorate and do my internship for the church. But now as a hospital chaplain, I mean, when in the 70s and 80s, HIV AIDS was far off in the horizon somewhere, but was that suddenly coming into focus in the 90s? Yeah, funnily enough, I was actually, I think I might have been the very first chaplain in the hospital services in South Africa to actually work with HIV patients. The, I was based at Kuriskia Hospital, but Somerset Hospital, um, which is now very close to where the waterfront is extended to in Cape Town, was where there was a clinic that received the first, at that stage, what was it, the late 80s, gay men who were HIV positive. It was very much part of that phase. Um, and I was comfortable with working with gay people and uh, so I agreed when they asked us for a chaplain and I would spend a day a week at Somerset Hospital. There was an outpatient clinic on, I think on a Tuesday and was available. Yeah, it was quite a, a moving experience. In fact, I have on my shelf a tape recorded sermon that I preached in 1989 on AIDS. So that's almost 20 years ago. Possibly also one of the first sermons in South African church on the issue. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I have sort of a sense of myself from wanting to pursue more of that because, um, but maybe afterwards we could come back to it. But yeah, because the irony for me is that as all this time, effort, and struggle and sacrifice that went into achieving, you know, equal society and to have this HIV AIDS yeah. phenomenon come just you know, how many people have been killed from that compared to from the military struggle, yeah. you know, it becomes a, a tragic irony yeah. that this sort of happened. But perhaps, you know, just, you know, come back to that later if we could. Um, yeah, you, you've come up with this marvellous metaphor of the olive agenda as being a blending of two discourses. Summarise it as best okay. you can for us. John, I've always been interested in questions of the environment, um, hiking and camping, living outdoors, enjoying, and, and of course being in Kuruman for six years put me very much in touch with rural life in South Africa. And coming here to head up this theology and development program with a very strong focus on poverty, it struck me that there are these, these two things that really do have to be put together. In, 19, in 2002, the South Africa hosted the World Summit on Sustainable Development and 
I was asked to be part of the South African Council of Churches group that got involved in, in preparing for that. And in my reading and my reflecting and, and in my teaching and supervision, I, it's difficult to know, it's kind of chicken and egg stuff, you know, everything's coming together. I started to see that there really is a polarized debate between the Greens, uh, people like the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, Greenpeace, um, with a very strong environmental ethic and, and agenda focusing on questions of climate change and um, species loss, biodiversity. And on the other side, a very strong group of people like Oxfam and um, other development agencies very focused on questions of poverty. It was the, in the wake of the Jubilee campaigns of 2000, fair trade and um, how do we create jobs for people? How do we get people out of poverty? And at the same time, I was doing some work with the World Council of Churches, their Justice Peace Creation Team, on the question of uh, food security and genetic engineering. And I started to become aware that this question of, for example, food security was, was both an environmental issue because it it was about biodiversity, it was about the fertility of the earth, it was about water, it was about climate. But it was very much about poverty issues. It was about uh, malnourishment, it was about uh, life expectancy, it, it was about quality of life. And so the, that sort of ball was in the air. But I was very struck by the South African government's inability to handle the environmental issue at the World Summit. And that tied in with some very interesting stuff I was reading around the Millennium Development uh, Goals and the Millennium uh, Report that was put out by the United Nations, where I tracked a whole lot of stuff around what, what fed into the Millennium Report, which ultimately led to the Millennium Summit, which led to the Millennium Declaration, which led to the Millennium Development Goals. And it was very interesting, in the, in the Africa region of the United Nations, uh, in the preparatory work leading up to the um, world, the um, Millennium Declaration uh, of the United Nations, the whole question of the environment had disappeared. Um, the term sustainable development got shifted to become sustainable growth and development. And if you read that, the background documents in Africa, you realize that the environmental issue was silenced by concerns around poverty. And I felt really strongly that that was, a, that was a significant point that people in Africa were making, is that in terms of felt experience, uh, the discourse was around poverty and was around economics and was around livelihoods. How do people survive? And yet, I was wise enough from what I was reading, well, I like to think I was wise enough to realize that the climate change stuff and the biodiversity stuff was not an invention of uh, well-fed greens from the north who had decided that we should all have polar bears or um, love trees and look after butterflies. But, and I, I then saw that there was a really important need to put these two things together. And it's crucial because actually the, the economy to which people in the south are looking as the, the saviour of jobs and, and growth and more income and resolving questions of poverty uh, is precisely the engine that is driving uh, climate change and environmental degradation. So this notion somehow that you can both up industrialization, up the jobs, up the economy and not at the same time be aware of the impact that it's having on the earth is a, is a false hope, a false dream. And that's where I got concerned and I was trying to find languages that would put these two things together and played around with the colours because I felt that the green agenda, I think it's a very clear agenda, in some senses I had to invent the concept, the brown agenda, although I had picked it up somewhere and I cannot for the life of me remember where, but as an agenda that's concerned about the poverty questions, questions of, of suffering because of lack of jobs, unemployment, lack of economic opportunity debt, um, high prices, structural adjustment policies, privatization, 
all the issues that are affecting mm -hmm. countries in the third world. And try to say, but these two discourses have to be brought together. And the olive was a, was a metaphorical attempt to do that. Um, is to say it, it's not, it has to be something of green and something, it has to be completely green like olive is and completely brown like olive is and yet it, it has, it, it's not just one plus one because in my experience you end up with binaries and um, the classic one in Christianity is between the spiritual and the material and uh, when you've got those binaries in the end one always prevails against the other and it's trying to find the the integrated synthesis that says you, you simply cannot talk about the one without at the same time talking about the other. Mm. So John, yeah, I mean that's a bit of the genesis of the idea. Mm. Um, and still. and for you the meaning of it, I mean, it, it's not entirely an uncontroversial thought in some respects. Um, I mean, the, the colour, the khaki, yeah. I mean, as somebody who resisted donning khaki <laughs> <laughs> in favour of whites yeah. <laughs> in the hospital. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, khaki, I suppose, funny, I never thought of it as a military metaphor, and I suppose it is in some ways. Um, I think of it more as a kind of Southern Africa colour. I think if you fly over Southern Africa, if you drive through parts of our country, it's I mean, they're, they're very green parts, Peter Maritzburg is an obvious one. They're very brown parts, Kuruman, kind of really brown. But the vast majority of our country, and I think of the winter grass uh, as that kind of khaki colour, and it's a, it's a very African uh, sort, of, mm. sort of colour in that sense. Mm. But what I liked about the metaphor is that the olive also is, has other, it has a surplus of meaning. I mean, it can be, can be teased, it can be played with. And so it's not, it's not a flat metaphor that has one meaning because, of course, you have the olive branch, the symbol of peace. You have um, olive oil and olive as a health metaphor and, and a lot of these issues. I think, I do think there are some integrating issues around the olive agenda. Health is one of them that, that's both an environmental issue and a poverty issue. Food is another one we've talked about. I think water is another one. Um, but I also thought the olive, what's nice about it is that it is a biblical metaphor and yet it's a metaphor that also belongs to the other Mediterranean cultures and races. Um, the olive tree is a very old tree, it goes back maybe four or five thousand years, they think, some of the earliest ones. So there's a real intergenerational sustainability question there about the trees, trees outlive us and we are here for such a short time and yet the impact of us, of our civilization in the last three hundred years on something as, as noble as the olive tree is. is uh, um, could you see it, how have people worked with it and taken up? I mean, has there been, for example, any suggestion that we form an olive party in South <laughs> Africa instead of a green party? Um, there is a discourse that says, you know, we need a green party yeah. in this country. Yeah. No, and, and to some extent I've been a little bit um, reticent, embarrassed, um, I don't know, to kind of push it as a, as a big sort of idea, uh, mainly because it's a, at the moment it's kind of metaphorical and symbolic, it doesn't, doesn't have, an, I haven't really given it that attention, but um, I have been approached in fact by an SABC cameraman recently um, with a view to, he was thinking of maybe putting something together in one of the faith programs on a Sunday mm -hmm. around that. He was, he picked it up uh, off the wires from the Belém uh, mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. conference that I spoke at. No, I, maybe I need to be a little bit more upfront with it as a kind of popular sort of notion. What has been interesting is actually in the last six months I've been very aware that government is starting to be aware that the environmental issue is, is crucial. And it's, um, you know, when I think of the, the issues on the olive agenda, I think of, uh, I've mentioned water, sewage is a key one. I think the cholera epidemic in, in Zimbabwe and that's having an impact on us is, you know, is both the green agenda, it's about fresh water, it's about fertility of the earth, it's about food, but it's also a brown agenda issue, it's about poverty issues, it's about people's access to resources. I think the taxi industry is, and, and motorized transport as a whole, but in this country the taxi industry is a really tough one. But it's, uh, our public transport system is hugely dependent on hundreds of 
taxis driving up and down and up and down. And it's part of the apartheid legacy, but it's a it's a significant issue. Waterborne sewage, uh, you know, from a green point of view, to pump fresh water in a water stressed country down the toilet. It's not a clever idea. But from a brown point of view, uh, what does it mean to, to consign people to the indignity of bucket toilets and long drops? Um, I wondered whether, in fact, perhaps the idea came to you when you were changing the nappies of your children. When they were, <laughs> what came to mind is this idea of a good breastfed baby produces a very <laughs> green, <laughs> the green and a brown. beautiful olive. <laughs> That's yeah. that. Yeah. And I wondered, if, and the thought was kind of further stimulated by watching uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Okay. Have you seen it? I haven't yet? seen that, yeah. Because there's a, a, one of the opening sequences, the older brother locks the younger brother in one of these long drop toilets in the okay. slum, you know. And at that, because at that point a famous Bollywood actor is arriving to kind of, in this helicopter. And the only way of escape was this youngster is to kind of dive straight into it. <laughs> and he comes running through, covered. But it becomes interesting, because yeah. I'd be interested from that point of view. Yeah. I've watched that film with a sort of a, having read your paper, with the sense right. that there is a deeper root metaphor, and particularly as you say, we all live downstream. Yeah. Now, elaborate on that okay. one, because it's a rather frightening thought. Yeah. The first time I realized what happens when water runs out and, and exactly what the real problem is, was in Kuruman, in fact. Um, Kuruman is in the Kalahari, on the edge of the Kalahari Desert, but it has the largest spring in the Southern Hemisphere and 20 million litres of water. So there's quite a lot of, uh, and, and that's just the biggest of the aquifers. There's a lot of uh, underground water and, and a lot of the Botswana tribes settled around these springs. And the mission, the Old London Missionary Society in Kuruman, their mission station, which is what I was the director of, had a borehole that had been sunk in the 1930s and it ran out. I mean, there was a day in which the, the, the submersible pump um, burnt out and I thought it was wear and tear and we replaced it and we put another one down <laughs> and it burnt out again and the guy came and pulled it out and said it's completely dry and it struck me then that the, the, um, the borehole had simply, the water table had dropped and it had passed a certain level. And the crisis was that that was a Wednesday, and on the Friday, a whole group of people, 60 people, were coming to spend the weekend with us on the mission for a wedding. Uh, good friends of ours were getting married and had asked to be married at, at the mission, and they were going to stay in the conference center. And I thought, okay, well, this is a problem, and we're going to have to do the, you know, re drill another borehole and all that. And, I realized that you, you could drink wine, I suppose, and beer and Coca-Cola and you can get bottled water to drink and you can cook. Uh, you need your water to cook with, but the real issue when you've got waterborne sewerage and you run out of the water is you, is you hit the shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you've got 60 people trying to flush uh, a toilet system that doesn't have water going through it. And the toilet, and that's when you long for a long drop, you know, that will just work. And it occurred to me then that the, the, the crux issue here is, is this question of, of what, where does the waste go? And I've been pondering that. I mean, I haven't had sleepless nights over it, but it started to occur to me again when uh, the cholera epidemic hit Zimbabwe, and I started to think, you know, we, we think a lot about the environmental issue in terms of um, extraction of raw materials, um, the industry and industrial waste, the distributive function of transport, and the consumption. And we talk of ourselves as a consumer society, but in fact, we don't consume everything. We, we waste an awful lot. There's an awful lot of byproduct from the consumption process. I know people have looked at that in terms of computers, where do they go, where do dead computers go, where do dead cars go. Um, there was that famous story about the barges floating in the northern Atlantic filled with um, these nappies, the, uh, what do they call Disposable them? Nappies. Disposable nappies, because they simply are designed not to break down. But, but the question really is, you know, 
in a water system and we all need water to drink and we, we're flushing our effluent, our industrial waste, our, our bodily wastes downstream, um, somehow that's got to come back. Now, you've got to ally that thought, John, with this, this other notion that I think is a helpful metaphor that for years we've lived in what Kenneth Boulding, a development economist, called a cowboy economy. The notion that we, we inhabited this space and when we'd messed this space up we simply went over the horizon to the next big plain and there we could set up another town and use another bit of water mm -hmm. and um, pollute another zone and kill off those animals and then when we'd used up as much as we wanted to there we would go the frontier would simply extend mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and we've reached the end of the frontier and we're now living in a, what he calls a spaceship economy, which is that, that everything is constrained by the globe. Uh, there is no other frontier. This is it. The water that exists on this earth, uh, the, the topsoil that exists on this earth, is, is it. And we cannot... At a certain point, the landfill, the, the sewerage, the waste, the, the effluent, uh, does tip. And I think anybody who has used a French drain or a sewerage, a long drop toilet, will know that mm. it can survive five years, ten years, fifteen years. But <laughs> there comes a moment when mm. you do hit hit the top, and I think mm. we've got to think a lot more about that. But and we need to think theologically. I mean, Eugene Peterson in one of his books says, "To divorce theology from geography ends up in nothing but trouble." Yeah, and it sounds to me like. You're talking about issues of more than just geography here, yeah, it's yeah. all sorts of other subjects, but the idea that there needs to be this bisection. Say a bit about what theological kind of, what does our theology have yeah. to offer to inspire yeah. us? I mean, because for goodness sake, live for today, you know, get it, get out of the slum yeah. any way you can. I mean, that's the story of slum yeah. millionaire. Hope that you're going to get the answers right. Yeah. And, and it ends in the marvelous sort of romantic love story. But that's not reality. So say a bit about how we can Look, deal with it. Theologically, that. it's a complicated issue um, because, in many ways, our, our Earth is both our home and not our home. Um, Earth, Earth is our home in the sense that this is what God has created, this is where God has put us. But there's enough theological tradition to suggest in popular theology that. That, that this is the veil of tears, this is the valley of the shadow of death, and our, our home lies beyond heaven, the kingdom, God will somehow make all things new. And, and so Christian theology sits with this double bind of both honoring the earth, because this is God's earth, and uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the creation story, um, this is God's place that he saw as good, and yet, on the other hand, a disavowing of this earth that um, uh, this is not our final resting place. Uh, we are going to a better place than this. And, and in a sense, if there's, there's, there's a real bad side of that to say the quicker we mess things up here, you know, the quicker God's going to have to take us to heaven. Now, I think I don't think we should run away from the fact that Christianity has both of those tensions, both a world affirming an earth-affirming notion, but also an earth-denying aspect. I think there are three resources that we can draw on theologically. Um, they're not all of the same level, but I think they do open up ways of thinking about it. I think the first and most obvious one is, is to tap into Christian traditions around suicide, which might come as a bit of a surprise, but I think there is something in it, that even though Christianity understands that earth is not our home and this body is not our final body and that we have a home in heaven in that in that language not entirely my language but I understand what it's pointing to um, nevertheless Christianity has very strong strictures against committing suicide uh, and if somebody came to me and said I'm fed up with this earth I want to go to heaven I'm gonna kill myself uh, I would I think most Christians would react and say no 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 that's not good God's given you life don't kill, don't kill yourself. And so we have that saying, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, and yet the only way theologically you get to heaven is, is through death. So it's a, this, this dynamic on an individual level. 
But the morality of that is an indication, I think, that you, you do not destroy this life, this earth, this, this space. You do not commit suicide for the sake of a quicker exit to get to heaven, however much you understand that. Now, I think that that's a profound tradition within Christianity that is an affirmation of this life. And if we come then to understand that our current economy, our current lifestyle is in fact a form of collective suicide, um, then there's a resource that we need to tap into. We need to not just on an individual level, but on a group level recognize that when we live in such a way that we are imperiling life, and we are, uh, then, then all of those Christian gut feelings that say that's wrong to commit suicide, uh, are a signal that this, this life is in fact important. So that's, that's one tradition and I've got a student who's just worked with that a bit. He's doing some work on, um, in Nigeria on, in the, with the Anglican Church around theology and he got quite a strong statement there and I think it's, even though it's in the Anglican Church, it's a strong Pentecostal evangelical feeling that why should we waste time and energy on this earth when our earth is not our home. And in conversation with him I suggested that he's work through this question of suicide and see whether there weren't some ethical things there. And he's been quite excited by that because uh, it's a language that will speak to a certain segment. I think a second resource is the concept of the oikos, the, the home, the earth. We've talked about this earth that is and isn't our home. The, the Greek word for uh, home or homestead or household is the oikos. And it's, it's a very profound word for us on this debate in terms of the olive agenda because it speaks exactly into this polarity because our English word for economy comes from oikos nomos uh, the oikos the home nomos the rules the laws um, and so the oikos nomos are the rules by which the household the homestead should run the irony is that ecology comes from exactly the same root, the oikos logos, uh, the study of the home, the wisdom of the home, the, the words about the home, the oikos logos, ecology. So economy and ecology, these two things, poverty and environment, brown agenda, green agenda, which separate out into almost a north-south dialogue, activists in the north interested in the environment, activists in the south interested in debt relief, the economy, poverty, unemployment. And yet they're both talking about the one home, oikos, the one oikos, our earth, our home. And it strikes me that theologically thinking of the earth as, as our home that God has created for humanity suggests that the rules of the household, the economy, the oikonomia, the oikos nomos, and the ecology, um, are, have to be the same thing, that, that the wisdom of the earth, its ecology and its rules for running it need to be the same and, and that stands and so we've talked theologically about God's economy. Okay. What are God's rules for running this earth, this home that we live in? And when our human rules and I think with industrialization, with the, emer the emergence of um, steam power and finally electric power, nuclear power, um, our, and urbanization of course, and, our, and, and then colonialism. Um, we have really set the, the rules of the economy over and against the natural rhythms and rules of the earth. So that... I'm going to... Um, just to watch you. Oh, sorry, there was a third one I wanted to yeah. just speak to, but should yeah, I mention yeah. that quickly? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The third one, sorry I'm pontificating I know, but uh, is what I've called the, the Jordan River or the promised land or land of promise metaphor. And, and I think one of the things biblically we struggle with is exactly this dichotomy is again the green agenda, people go immediately to Genesis 1 and 2, God created the earth, it was beautiful. The brown agenda, people go to Exodus, God saw his people oppressed and said, let my people go. So you have a liberation motif against oppression and a creation motif in terms of the beauty of the earth. And the, again, these two agendas, again, it's the green and the brown, the oikonomia, the oikologos, just struggling to talk. Whereas, I think biblically where they come together is at the entry to the promised land, um, 
where the people of God, in a sense, who are now free and who live out that freedom and are reminded of that through the Passover, uh, their freedom, their liberation, and the jubilee laws and the laws around the economy, not to oppress, not to oppress the widow, the alien, the orphan. So there's a whole brown agenda there. And nevertheless, it's, it's to take possession of an earth, a land, a space of milk and honey, of olive trees. Uh, and the festival of, of uh, the booths, the first fruits of the harvest, are a reminder that the God who frees against oppression and slavery is also the God of fertility of the harvest. And I think biblically that's where these two traditions come together, is the notion of, of caring for the earth into which one, one moves. Mm. Um, the idea of theology and geography, if you read and relook at the scriptures as you do, with, shall we say, not rose-tinted, but olive-tinted glasses, as, I mean, as I've been doing, and with the influence of Thomas Berry specifically, mm. where he says the, f the primary revelation is not Scripture, it's the earth. Yeah. The first, and it's in the context of earth and God's creation that, we, that Scripture has any meaning whatsoever. Yeah. And that, for some might say, it seemed odd, because Christian church has been perceived, people on the outside have perceived, has been very much about, as you described this, it's, this isn't our homeland. And that's given me a whole new kind of grounding, even if you look at the issue of the plagues of, 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 of Egypt. Exactly. They were ecological exactly. disturbances. Exactly. They were about injustice and a disturbance of that oikos, logos, yeah. uh, oikos, nomos. Exactly. And, and, and as a consequence, an unsustainable society. Exactly. So in a sense, one could even argue that it wasn't just about the Jews as the problem being saved in the sort of, in the, in sort of very possessive sense to be going, camp somewhere else and was saying this ordering of reality is not sustainable yeah. and a people were taken out of it yeah. under very harsh in ecological environmental conditions and were able then to hopefully model it and I found that a whole new kind of interest in scripture exactly. which I has, hadn't seen until this ecological yeah. crisis. You see in the Noah story is exactly the same of course mm -hmm. is that the people are, are wicked and their wickedness ultimately results in, in the flood. You know, the, whether that's, a, I've often wondered if that's not a very deep, deep, deep psychic memory of, of the end of the Ice Age and, and a thawing and a sense of uh, somewhere in there. But it's, yeah, again, this notion that, that when things go wrong between human beings, the earth is gonna, gonna react with locusts, with f uh, frogs, with, uh, with flood. And we stand, a Deuteronomy quote, and the River Jordan, from the Sea of Galilee, which is life, and the Dead Sea is dead. Yeah. Just finish with a little bit of a, <laughs> a flourish. On well, that. I, think, I think that, that the choice, you see, I, I think that really the, the, the root metaphor theologically is the question of life. Um, because it's, life is not divisible. Our, our human life is part of the earth life. And, uh, and earth life is part of the, the life that water gives us and air gives us and the life of the, the fertility of the earth and, and the fertility of our lives. And, and to choose life, which is, the, which is such a profound moral choice that Moses uh, puts before the people as they are about to cross the Jordan River and enter this land where they have to balance the economy against the ecology, to make it a land flowing with milk and honey where the, the widow and the alien and the orphan are, have justice. And, and I think there's a, once I started to think about it in terms of water, it struck me that where he says, I've set before you today both life and death, uh, blessings and curses. And they're standing at the River Jordan, and it, and it struck me, and this is the question of your geographical lenses, is that actually the River Jordan is this umbilical cord that links the water of life, uh, the Galilee, rising in the Lebanon hills and flowing into Galilee and and with the waters of death at the Dead Sea and I would imagine having spent 40 years in the wilderness these folks would have some sense of of bad water they must have got they must have known about the Dead Sea I mean you, you couldn't have lived in that part of, of the world and not had a sense of that and yet the fresh water and and so water like the the, the, the Garden of Eden is is an ambiguous resource uh, and the apple tree or whatever that tree was some said maybe it was an olive tree that Adam and Eve had to deal with is again 
in the, the, the human moral choice is, is here's this earth, here's the, the tree of life, here's the water. And, and it's, it's how we choose to set up our and respond to it that can either flow to life or to death. And so Moses says, having given the law and how to live on the land, I have set before you blessings and curses and, and life and death. Choose life. And I think the choice for life then is not just human life over and against other human life, but it really is human life in dialogue with, with the fertility of the life of this earth. And then Jesus being baptized again in that very Jordan River at the beginning of his public ministry. Yeah. Tell my 16 year old daughter in the confirmation class something that's going to, yeah, we've got our kids who are going to have to inherit this. I mean, yeah. it's the life we've been part yeah. to creating in our yeah. own parental role. I think, I think a couple of things are really important in terms of how do you make this practical, this sort of agenda practical, how do you live out this Jordan River ethic, how do you choose life in this context and not death. I think there's a spectrum of responses. Clearly we've got to learn to live more simply. I think the, the, the using up of resources uh, and the, the waste that flows from them is, is something that we really have got to be more serious about. I think in terms of the sewerage issue, we've got to th think about the fact that we live downstream and that others live downstream from us and we are in turn downstream from, from others and, and therefore to be concerned about questions of water and sewerage and, and look after those. I think we need to really nurture those skills and those professions which are going to help us. I, I when I went to university, the engineers were the ones we saw as the right-wing conservatives who just wanted to make money. But it does strike me that we need some alternative thinking engineers. We need, we need people who are attentive to the, the olive agenda, who have the skill capacity to know how to engineer safe water systems, sewerage systems. Um, we probably are going to need to, re to find the nobility in agriculture again. I think we cities are going to become unsustainable uh, because once the water runs out, once the ability to produce food is, is diminished for the city, um, we're going to cross a certain line where the rural areas simply cannot produce enough food for the cities and that's going to be an important thing. So I think not, not looking down one's nose at people who garden and who grow vegetables and not believing that somehow milk is made in a factory and apples come out of a, um, a box is, is an important thing. And, and yet I think the particular genius of people in our context in Southern Africa is, is not to allow at the same time the green agenda to, be, to become distant from questions of poverty and unemployment and, and AIDS and land struggles so that you get a, a knee-jerk reaction from people in the south to say we know this environmental issue is a great hoax from people in the north so i think speaking the speaking these things together is is really important and i think seeing it as part of christian christian witness christian discipleship that how we treat the earth is in a sense how we treat our neighbor and therefore how we treat god is is really important this this is what god has has given us um, not for us to, to have dominion over in that old way that we've understood it, but really I prefer the, the, the Genesis 2 verse 13 concept of to till the earth and to keep it. Uh, what does it mean to keep this earth, to be earth keepers? Um, is going to be the growing... And like I had to struggle in the 70s with questions of conscientious objection, and in a sense standing against my culture, against my race, against the the default option. We are going to need conscientious objectors in, in this generation who do the surprising thing and nevertheless who, who are a, a pain in the neck to the powers that be uh, and, and remind them that, that we have to live differently. <laughs>